I spent two days this last week volunteering for my local community radio station, KMUZ, in uh, Salem, although we're licensed to uh, Turner, which is a very small place outside of Salem. Uh, Three times a year, we do a pledge drive to fund the station, to pay the bills, the electric bills, the rent, all that stuff. Everything is completely voluntarily run. Uh, I've been a part of this since the beginning, which goes back, well, we've been on the air almost seven years. Uh, December 17th will be seven years. And there was two or three years before that that I was involved. So it's close to, close to 10 years that I've been involved as a volunteer. I was on the original uh, board, the founding board. So I was one of the, I think, seven people that, that uh, officially got this thing kicked off. I was involved before that. You know, it was kind of funny because I, I heard about this happening and I went down to a volunteer meeting and I signed up thinking, yeah, I can volunteer. I want to do a reggae show. And I thought, would it be easy? And, and I had no idea what I would be getting myself into. Uh, long story short, there was a lot of twists and turns in that first two years before we actually got on the air. Uh, we got saved by some old radio colleagues of mine who donated a bunch of equipment, and we got up and running by the skin of our teeth because the deadlines the FCC had given us. But uh, it was a lot of fun, so I continued to volunteer, and I do a radio show every Monday night, uh, 6 to 8 o'clock Pacific time. You can tune in at kmuz.org. That's why I'm wearing the KMUZ hat today. Uh, so volunteerism, I think that's a, a neat topic. And I look back at other things that I've done over the years. Uh, I w- belong to a, a church, a Unitarian Universalist church, for 10 or 15 years here in town and was a big volunteer there. That, that made me feel pretty good. Uh, for a couple of years, I was a loaned executive through United Way and we'd go out and pitch local businesses on giving to United Way. That was a lot of fun as well. But I, I, I have nothing that I've done that compares to what my dad did. <laughs> so let me tell you about my dad just a little bit. Um, oh, by the way, this is Tim Patterson. It's Trade Show Guy, Monday Morning Coffee, and that's what you're listening to. So volunteerism is what I'm I'm talking about a little bit. My dad, who passed away at 92 just a couple of years ago, uh, volunteered a lot. And he was he never really, really made a big deal out of it. In fact, he didn't really make a big deal out of anything except the time that he and uh, my mom who's still around at 90, uh, hiked from Mexico to Canada on the Pacific Crest Trail when he retired. I think he was uh, 64 or 65 when they started, and mom would have been four years younger. It took him two years to finish it. They actually took a year off and went to Europe and hiked there and came back and finished like the last couple hundred miles or something up in Washington. Uh, But he, he liked to brag about that, but nothing else did he really brag about. But for 30 or 35 years, he made cabinets for Habitat for Humanity. He had a little uh, wood shop, a, a workshop that he made cabinets for. The, he would deliver them. He'd put them on a little trailer and take them to various parts of Oregon. He'd run to Coos Bay, and he'd, he'd stop by maybe and uh, visit me, and he'd say, yeah, I'm just running some cabinets down to the coast. And so he did that for a long time. The other thing he did, which I thought was uh, interesting, that I didn't even know about him doing it until it just kind of happened. Uh, I grew up uh, in the mountains with with my family. He and my mom managed a place called Santiam Lodge, which was a Presbyterian church camp at the time, up in the, the top of Santiam Pass. And one of the things he did, I'm guessing, because uh, I don't know the details, I was probably uh, 10 or 15 years old, somewhere in that neighborhood, uh, 10, 12 years old, that my dad all of a sudden became an emergency medical technician. And I kind of remember him going into town. Town was either Sisters, 20 miles away, or Bend, or Redmond, about 40 miles away. And he would go in and take classes and come back, and he became an EMT, a trained EMT, so that uh, he volunteered up on the mountain whenever there was an accident or anything, like we had the Pacific Crest Trail going right next to our our front yard. Uh, And he would volunteer to help people out in in medical uh, situations, emergencies, and things like that. He always stayed up to date on his uh, you know, whatever the, 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 the training that he needed. And then when he retired, he and my mom moved to a place called Gates, Oregon, which is down the hill, uh, probably 35 miles east of Salem. And for years, he volunteered for the fire department there as an EMT, and he'd go out on traffic accidents and things like that, and never accepted a dime for it. He just said, I'm here to help if I can. And again, never made a big deal about it, but uh, he was always doing something for somebody else. And and I think it took me a while to figure out that that was a good thing to do um, because he never made a big deal out of it. I just kind of watched him. And then at one point in my adult life, I said, you know what? I, I could be volunteering too. 
So I do a little bit of it, but not nearly what he did and not nearly as long. So uh, there you go. That's my thing on volunteerism. Uh, it's always good. You feel good when you help other people. The people that you help are very grateful. But I, uh, frankly, I think that, that the person that gets the most out of it is the person that's giving of their time. It's it, it just happens that way. That's the way human nature is. That's the way we socialize. If you help somebody, you feel good about it. If someone asks you for help, you feel good about being able to give them help. So if you can volunteer at anything, no matter what it is in your community, uh, on a large scale, small scale, whatever, I would highly recommend it. All right, so it's going to be a short uh, podcast vlog today. That was pretty much the the guts of it right there. I do want to give you a trade show tip of the week here in a second. Uh, And I got some books to talk about. If you haven't seen my books, I'd love to have you go pick up a copy uh, at Amazon. This is called Trade Show Success, 14 Proven Steps to Take Your Trade Show Marketing to the Next Level. This one is called uh, Trade Show Superheroes and Exhibiting Zombies, 66 Lists, Making the Most of Your Trade Show Marketing. And for our Trade Show Tip of the Week, I'm going to uh, give you kind of a a brief version of one of the lists that actually Mel White of a classic exhibits uh, included in this. He, He... submitted it and it's on the blog and a lot of the stuff in the blog made it into the book the blog by the way trade show guy blog.com so his list uh 13 most common trade show mistakes and it's actually four or five pages i'm going to give you uh, kind of the, the the short version uh number one mistake is going too big we all want to be the big dog on the block a lot of exhibit companies do that but there are reasons not to do that uh you know <laughs> you don't really need big enclosed conference rooms on everything. Maybe it's a good deal. You don't need the second story. So sometimes going big is not the right thing to do. Number two, going too small. Uh, in general, though, the smaller exhibits get less traffic than larger exhibits. Uh, often it's due to location. Uh, bigger exhibits generally more centrally located, but uh, you know you can go too small. So Number three, not setting specific goals. Uh, if you go to a trade show not knowing exactly why you're there, other than the you know general generic term, uh, increase sales or generate more leads, you're probably not going to do as well as if when you set a very specific goal, like what what do you want? Why do you want those leads? How, how do you want to accomplish that? Those types of things. Uh, number four mistake, most common trade show mistake is cluttered graphics uh graphics are a big deal at trade show that's how you deliver your message that's how you qualify and disqualify people at a glance if people look up and see something that's confusing to them they don't know whether to come visit you or not if they see something that really specifies what you do how you do it why you are there they can say to themselves ah i'm interested or "Mm, not for me because that's not what they're there for. So uh, graphics. Number five, giveaways for the sake of giveaways. I mean, how many pens and stress balls do you really need? But if you have a great giveaway that works, uh, that that helps people remember who you are, that makes an impression, then come up with a giveaway. A good promotional products person can probably do that for you. Number six, a mistake. Uh, booth staff not trained. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> this is one of our pet peeves in the industry that we see happening. Uh, In fact, I think I just wrote a blog post about this last week about a booth staff uh, being proactive and a lot of a lot of booth staffers are not. They're sitting there on a chair, they're on their phone, they're eating a sandwich, they have their hands in their pockets, their arms are crossed. There's so many ways that a booth staffer can give a negative message through body language to someone that is passing by. Uh, So having a properly trained booth staff Uh, Knowing how to interact with people and knowing your products is very, very important. Number uh, seven, poor follow-up on leads. And as Mel put it, why would you bring your own rope to your hanging? So (laughs) that's a good way to put it. Uh, You have all these leads, but they don't get followed up on. Why is that? It's still statistically accurate in the industry that almost eight out of 10 leads that are collected don't get followed up on. And there's a lot of reasons for it. Uh, Sometimes the leads weren't graded. So when you get them back, the first three calls the sales guy makes is to someone that had very little interest in it. Uh, Although there may be 17 others in that list that they're very high interest. So, but they don't know that. So maybe they're not properly graded. They're not uh, not enough information on what the follow-up should be. There's just a lot of reasons why uh, leads don't get followed up on. So do do a better job of that. Number na- uh, eight, no daily booth preparation. And as Mel puts it, when your in-laws come to town, you spend days cleaning, organizing, and stressing over dust bunnies. 
Three days later, you don't care anymore. It's kind of the same way with your your trade show booth. Uh, you polish and preen uh, before the show opens. Uh, then by day two, you know, you're ignoring everything. The, 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 the smudges, carpet boogies, and the stray candy wrappers and the garbage, you know, coming out. So uh, keep your booth clean. Number nine, partying and socializing. Yes, it's a trade show. You're supposed to be socializing. Uh, but the big but is you need to be smart about it. You're, you're there on company time. You're there. You're being paid by the company. Uh, they're paying for your hotel room. So, you know, going out till two in the morning just because uh, some crazy guy that you really like uh, on, on a client or a potential client invites you out to go to a show and you're there till like two in the morning drinking, mm, that wouldn't work really well. So uh, be smart about partying and socializing. Number 10, packing and unpacking. Um, you know, we get it. You're tired. You want to get back to your room, the airport or home, uh, understandable. But uh, how you pack and unpack your booth uh, will make your life much easier or much harder as time goes on. Number uh, 11, going to the wrong shows or not going to the right shows. Often it takes a, a time ahead of going exhibiting at a show that you actually walk the show floor once so you get a feel for it. If you can't do that, you really say, gosh, six months, I need to be at that show, I think. Uh, find out who's at the show. Talk to them. Find out people that have exhibited there. Uh, see if your competitors are there. There's lots of reasons and lots of ways that you can decide if that is a show appropriate for you. All right. Number 12, not walking the show and talking to competitors, suppliers, and potential partners. Uh, don't just stay in your booth. You got to have enough people there so that you can walk the floor and talk to other people, other exhibitors, as well as attendees to get a better understanding for the show, uh, to do networking, uh, you know, but, but think about it. Trade shows are really two-way streets. Potential customers are there to learn, and you're there to work with those customers, but also to learn and discover as well. And number 13, not doing any pre-show marketing. Um, as, as, as he puts it, this may be last, but it's certainly not least. What kind of pre-show marketing can you do? Well, you can do everything from making a phone call to people that you want to be there and set up appointments with, to emailing, to social media, to sending out snail mail, uh, to really doing elaborate snail mail promotions to get people there. But those are the top 13 mistakes that uh, are most common in trade show marketing. All right, so just about to wrap up with one good thing. My new hero, by the way, is 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 the one good thing. Beryl Markham. Uh, she lived from 1902 to 1986, I believe, and she has this wonderful book called West with the Night. So why is she my new hero? Well... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got wind of this. I think it was from reading a newsletter a year or two ago by, and I mentioned this uh, guy before, Roy Williams. His newsletter is called um, uh, The Monday Morning Memo. It's about marketing. It's great. But he mentioned this book, and uh, let me read the back of this. I'll tell you who wrote this. So this is from a letter to Maxwell Perkins. I don't know who Maxwell Perkins is, but it's a letter from this guy. Did you read Beryl Markham's book, West with the Night? I knew her fairly well in Africa and never would have suspected that she could put, could and would put pen to paper except to write in her flyer's log book. As it is, she has written so well and marvelously well that I was completely ashamed of myself as a writer. I felt that I was simply a carpenter with words, picking up whatever was furnished on the job and nailing them together and sometimes making an okay pig pen. Uh, but she can write rings around all of us who consider ourselves as writers. The only parts of it that I know about personally on account of having been there at the time and heard the other people's stories are absolutely true. I wish you would get it and read it because it is really a bloody wonderful book. Signed, Ernest Hemingway. So that's what Ernest Hemingway thinks about this uh, book called uh, West with the Night. And it, it's, her, it's a memoir. It's, a, it's her life story in a sense in pieces. She grew up uh, at the age of four. Her family, her, her dad moved her to East Africa, which is where she grew up. Uh, they built a farm and then she became in her uh, 20s an aviator, a flyer. She learned to fly and, and was kind of a bush pilot in Africa for five or six years before she went on to other things. This is mostly about a couple events in her childhood and about her days as a a flyer, an aviator in East Africa. And it, it, it as, as Ernest Hemingway put it, it is marvelously written. Uh, the way she uh, tells stories about run-ins with lions and elephants and, and all sorts of crazy stuff and rhinoceroses and, and, and in Africa, growing up as a kid, as a teenager, just that was your normal everyday life. Uh, it, she has become my new hero. And the back photo is really pretty interesting too. All right, so that does it. 
uh, pick it up. I'll put a link. I think it's still available on Amazon. It was out of print for a long time, and it came back in print back in the 80s. I think this was published in, like, 1946. Uh, wonderful book. Have yourself a great week. Uh, find me at tradeshowguyblog.com if you're not already there. Uh, go to our website as well, our company site, tradeshowguyexhibits.com. This is Tim Patterson, Trade Show Guy. And uh, signing off for another week, I'll catch you next week.